Welcome to the video recording of the lecture on vegetation management. Our vegetation management lecture is following on from our lecture on managing energy inputs, managing system metabolism, or the rates of photosynthesis, nutrient cycling, and water cycling, uh, and managing the stocks of soil water and nutrients. And so now we're going to cover vegetation management. In this lecture, we're going to talk about active planting methods, species choice and design, promoting dispersal and recruitment, and last but not least, managing disturbance. So in terms of active planting methods, we can establish new species at the site through planting container plants. Uh, and you see here a, a picture of, of container plants being planted at a site here. Um, plugs, which would be smaller container plants, typically small elongated tubes and more juvenile plants uh, through cuttings, particularly mule fat and willows. Uh, if you plant cuttings in the ground, roots will develop at, at the leaf nodes. Plants can be established that way. Layering is a technique that can be used, especially our manzanita shrubs, uh, species like that. Uh, if you uh, bend a branch down and bury a portion of that branch, roots can, will develop from the nodes. So it's a way of, of, of cloning plants. Uh, uh, seeding, um, and finally, uh, recruitment. The considerations for active planting are the costs. Typically, active planting is more expensive than other ways of getting species established at the site. Um, so we have to be very judicious and use passive restoration and recruitment to, to the extent possible. Species choice and choosing species that are appropriate to the site um, and placement of the species within the site. So we've talked a bit about this issue of plant spacing um, and, you know, some plants needing to be spaced a foot apart, two feet apart, eight feet apart, or in the case of some trees, even 30 feet apart. But another issue related to placement um, is where plants are planted uh, along a topo sequence. Uh, so here we have, um, in a salt marsh restoration project in San Francisco Bay, California, uh, moderately well-drained soils, somewhat poorly drained soils, and poorly drained soils, uh, depending on where the site is located on that adjacent upland uh, to the pickleweed marsh, and a, a suite of species that are adapted to each one of these topographic positions. Here we see the same thing. We've got our borrow pit channel here adjacent to a levee with a road on it, and the plantings that are appropriate to each topographic position shown here. And this is the type of thing that you can provide work crews, um, you know, as guidance in addition to plant spacings and plant species lists, the number of species uh, contained. So when choosing a, a plant species mix, the species choice typically begins from our reference sites and often using historical records from a watershed. So in class, uh, we had looked at an example of, of one species, Yerba Mansa, uh, which is a common wetland and riparian species uh, in the southern coastal zone. And we looked at the consortia of herbarium. These are six herbarium records uh, that, that you can search and actually find out if a plant has been historically located or is even currently located in the watershed. And so increasingly, um, resource agencies are requiring that restoration plans not only are, are, are all species from the county, but increasingly that there are records from the actual watershed where the project is located. Additional considerations when developing the species mix, um, the functional role of plants, uh, we may want to ensure, for example, that there are prolific cedars to bounce back after fire, um, that there are enough plants that attract pollinators, berry-bearing shrubs that will attract birds and, uh, for seed dispersal. Um, we may need some nitrogen fixers. Uh, so that functional role of the plants is something we have to consider. Canopy architecture. What we're considering here is that we have, um, you know, for, in the case of, of grassland, for example, that we have a mix of tall perennial bunch grasses, uh, shorter stature, annual grasses, trailing vines, 
uh, rosette herbs and uh, upright herbs uh, so that all uh, niches uh, are filled within that system and all portions of the canopy architecture are filled. Uh, this applies whether you're dealing with wetlands, whether you're dealing with grasslands, or even forest lands, although the most amount of research has been done on forests for this. And what this does uh, is it makes the system more resistant to invasion, and specifically we're talking about invasive plants. We also have to consider plant phenology, and so that all those functional roles and that canopy architecture uh, is maintained throughout the seasons. We have to consider what disturbance uh, we're likely going to encounter over time at the site and how ecosystem succession is going to occur. Um, and we may have to account for, for putting species in the species mix that will allow succession to occur um, or um, that, that we're not, we're, some of the later successional species we may assume are going to appear through, through, through recruitment, but that we do need to, to add actively plant species that are going to serve as a, effectively as a nurse system. Uh, so those are just some examples of some additional considerations when choosing uh, your planting palette. Promoting seed dispersal and uh, species recruitment. If you remember our example from uh, the Amazon, bird species were found to forage in old fields, um, mostly very close to the forest field edge. And so in the interior portions of old fields, bird diversity and abundance and also the seed rain uh, was was quite low, um, except in cases where berry-bearing shrubs were found uh, and that these served as effective islands of biotic activity uh, that increased forest regeneration rates. Um, and so this principle, we can promote seed rain in old fields through planting berry-bearing shrubs that attract seed dispersers, uh, placing bird perches in abandoned fields, um, establishing hedgerows, um, or other types of corridors in abandoned fields. Um, and one that's quite interesting that can be used here in California quite a bit, uh, structures that reduce wind speed and traps uh, seeds, so woody debris and nurse plants and, and the, this sort of thing. Another way to promote seed dispersal and species recruitment is actually through hydraulic seed dispersal um, and planting in key hydraulic areas and, and pinch points, so at the inlet um, for a wetland or a salt marsh. Um, and focus most of your planting there um, and let the water do the work over the years of uh, dispersing uh, some of those species over the site. That's an example of how you can um, potentially get the biggest bang for your buck, reduce the overall cost of your project, um, and still have um, um, you know, some, some provision for getting uh, uh, th these species established throughout the site, provided there is invasive species control to support that, that recruitment. So here we have an example of a buoy-deployed dispersal. Here a, a, a pearl net, um, and uh, you fasten the pearl net to, to a buoy, and in this case uh, put um, a reproductive seagrass in the pearl net that let these, these pearl nets drift with the natural current, and it, it, it's been shown to have a, a, a pretty good level of success. Uh, here's an example in the Antelope Valley, uh, planting, uh, fastening these pearl nets uh, with the seed mix, um, fastening it to rebar, um, and with the winter rains, this seed mix can then be uh, washed out of the pearl nets and effectively um, dispersed throughout this wetland area. You know, one of the advantages of doing that is that you're, you're allowing the water um, to transport the seed and deposit it with the sediment in a much more natural way, uh, in a way that, that, that is more effective than, than, than potentially hand broadcast seeding, and is more cost effective as well. Another way to um, establish species on site and to manage species on site is through managing disturbance. Uh, so the dominant disturbance types here in California are grazing, fire, and flooding. Disturbance is important for, for maintaining ecosystems and can actually be used as restoration tools. 
And when they're used as restoration tools, typically uh, these are shifts in the frequency and intensity of disturbance uh, that influences vegetation dynamics. For example, fire can be used uh, and prescribed burns can be used as a restoration tool. Um, grazing can be reintroduced or excluded depending on what your goals and objectives are. And flooding, we talked about flooding as a, as a seed dispersal uh, mechanism, but in uh, wetland and especially in riparian restoration, uh, flooding um, is, is really essential uh, for creating early successional stages and, and increasing the structural diversity of your riparian woodlands. Um, and, you know, we talked about the example of um, um, Lee Spells Vireo uh, and Willow Flycatcher as being dependent on that structural diversity. Um, so let's, ha let's look at some examples of managing disturbance and let's look in our own backyard at, at, at Santa Rosa Island. Um, and so Santa Rosa um, uh, is part of the Channel Islands. It was managed by the, the island Chumash for up to 13,000 years. Population densities may not have been very high or may not have been continuously populated for that entire time. Um, but we do have a, a, a history of land management that dates back quite some time. Uh, grazing was introduced in the 1840s after a land grant to the Cabrillo family. Um, and by, by the 1900s, early 1900s, herds were about 60 to 100,000 sheep and about 5,000 cattle. Um, and, and actually at their apex, for example, sheep herd sizes were, were, were upwards of 200,000. Um, and cattle at their apex at, at about 8,000. But that 60 to 100,000 sheep and 5,000 cattle, you know, is, is a median estimate over time at any given time. Um, and the island vegetation, uh, the, the local varieties did not evolve with the influence of, of ungulate grazers. Um, and so this really induced large-scale vegetation change um, and induced um, um, landslides and, and, and gully erosions. And so, so here we see, see a picture, you know, of, of you know, a historic photo of, of, of a cattle drive. Um, and, you know, in the highlands up on Soledad Ridge, uh, we have uh, the island oak woodlands um, and you see these bare and denuded ridge lines with the gully erosion um, off of the, the side slopes. Um, and so grazing had a significant impact on Santa Rosa Island and, 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 and the vegetation. And um, now that in, in 1986, uh, the Santa Rosa Island was incorporated into the Channel Islands National Park, uh, non-native grazer removal um, um, began. And this is really an excellent test of pastoral restoration theories. And for the purposes of our class, a really good illustration um, of managing disturbance um, um, for uh, vegetation management, uh, restoration of, of, of vegetation. So um, all non-native grazers were removed from Santa Rosa Island by 2001. And so if you look at the timeline, in 1843, ranching begins. Uh, by 1903, the sheep were removed. Um, 1980, the established the Channel Islands National Mining, and by 1986, the incorporation of Santa Rosa Island into Channel Islands National Park. Um, in 1992, uh, all feral pigs were removed. Uh, by 1998, the cattle were removed. And by 2011, the non-native deer and elk were um, also um, culled and, and, and removed. So those are our, our mule deer and Roosevelt elk that were introduced as part of a, a large game hunting operation. Um, and so... Um, the SRM department and CSUCI in partnership with uh, the National Park Service. So we've been um, doing some monitoring um, of the vegetation change following the non-native grazer, grazer removal. 
And so the methods that we've been using is, is a vegetation change detection um, with Landsat TM5 and, and Landsat 8 imagery. Uh, and so, so far we've got uh, from 1989 to 2015, a time series of, of, of vegetation change. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to be adding new years into the future. We've got N, uh, NPS 30-meter uh, point intercept permanent transects, and so that's a data set going back to 1990. Uh, we've got stand demography and regeneration studies of the Island Oak, uh, Torrey Pines, uh, now we're starting Island Ironwood, uh, Bishop Pine, uh, and aerial photo interpretation from 1929 to 2011. Um, the uh, results really have been quite dramatic. So um, here we see two uh, what are called classified images. So uh, these are Landsat Thematic Mapper 5. Um, images from 1989 and 2011. And each 30 meter by 30 meter pixel um, is classified as bare ground, grassland, scrub, island chaparral, woodland, or sand. And so these are very broad vegetation classifications. These are not floristic classifications. Um, and just very broadly categorizing the, the vegetation, uh, classifying the vegetation, sorry. Um, and we used a maximum likelihood classification with training six pixels from 87 of the NPS inventory monitoring vegetation transects and creating additional regions of interest. So that basically means you are creating a series of training pixels uh, that if you know um, okay, these pixels are bare, these pixels are grass, these pixels are scrub, these pixels are island chaparral, um, then uh, you, by using an algorithm, you can actually then classify um, the other pixels throughout the island and over time. Um, and the classification accuracy for this exercise, we actually did ground truthing, and the classification accuracy is from 59.8 to 91.3 percent, depending on cover type. Um, and that 59.8 is a bit low, but it is actually, um, you know, higher than than similar or higher than other other studies. There's there's some reasons why this Landsat. Um, approach is, is, is difficult in, in low biomass uh, arid and semi-arid uh, systems l like what we have um, out, out in, uh, in Santa Rosa with the, the Mediterranean climate. Um, and <clears throat> when you look at the change over time, again from 1989 to 2015, this time series, and so look at, for example, these scrub in, in green. Um, you've got a long-term increase in scrub, and you've got a long-term decrease in grassland, um, and a also a slightly positive trend over time for woodland and chaparral, and a decrease in bare ground. Uh, sum these all up, and we've got regeneration of 42.1 square kilometers of woody vegetation, so that's scrub, chaparral, and woodland combined. Uh, and uh, a grassland decreasing by 31.2 uh, kilometers square and bare ground by uh, 12 kilometers squares. Um, so that's a really uh, dramatic change um, that is associated with the removal of these non-native grazers. And so, um, you know, indicating that indeed the passive restoration is not only occurring, but it's occurring over extensive areas. Um, however, uh, you know, there are limits uh, to how well passive restoration can work. Um, so as an example, woody species are colonizing grasslands. So this is a, a, a view. The, these uh, are some of the MPS 30-meter um, point intercept transects. And, and so looking at, at the relative cover um, of mule fat, I'm sorry, uh, the relative cover of coyote brush um, and uh, of, of California sagebrush 
uh, over time. And so you see that from 1990 to about 2014, um, you, you do have an increase in, in coyote brush in, in the grassland transects. The same uh, for California sagebrush. Um, but in some cases, uh, this results in vegetation that is essentially grassland with emergent coyote brush and California sagebrush, um, which kind of begs the question, and we'll be covering this later on in the course, um, is this what we're seeing out in Santa Rosa? Is this a novel ecosystem? So you've got your grassland here, you've got your undisturbed scrub, and, and, and you've got grassland with emergent shrubs that floristically is still more closely, potentially more closely aligned uh, with grassland uh, than it is uh, with the undisturbed scrub. Um, other effects, floristic effects, and so, you know, again, you know, we've, we, we, we reviewed and we looked at um, the large-scale and long-term changes in vegetation. And so here we're looking within each vegetation type, what are the changes in species composition? Um, and we see that from 1990 to uh, 2014, which you know spans our, our removal period for uh, removal of non-native grazers, um, purple needle grass type of pulchra is increasing. Uh, Bromus carinatus increasing, uh, and saltgrass decreasing, um, and a, 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 a grouping of various uh, wild barley, native barley species, hordeum, um, uh, decreasing. Uh, and so you, we have a trend where a, a lot of the native bunch grasses are actually increasing over time following the removal of non-native grazers, but a lot of the annual grasses are decreasing and to an extent that the, the salt grass, um, which you know requires certain conditions to be competitive, um, also decreasing. And so you have um, California poppy, the Scholzia californica, um, and the uh, lupinus bicolor, the miniature lupine, um, also decreasing. So these forbs, a lot of the forbs decreasing, and a lot of the non-native grasses um, increasing and the non-native forbs decreasing. So you've got uh, really some species shifts that are occurring. Um, and yes, you do have a proliferation of non-native grasses um, at the expense of some forbs, but you also have a proliferation of um, native bunch grasses. And so uh, in, in some, you know, we've got um, a change in community composition within the grassland uh, following non-native grazer removal um, and, and, and a predominance of European annual species um, towards uh, native grassland species. Um, other examples, um, so high intensity grazing with longer rest periods increased the distribution of, of, of perennial grasses. So this was really a quite interesting study um, uh, from, from the Bay Area, uh, published in Ecological Restoration, uh, where um, it, it was a test of, of some of this high intensity, fast rotation grazing. Uh, what is the effect on, on native grasses, and, and is there a restorative effect? And so uh, we're talking 150 to 200 head of cattle per hectare, uh, and, you know, which is a, an incredibly high stocking density. Um, and from 2011 to 2012 to 2013, here we see the distribution that just, this is just simple present at presence absence um, in the different grazing cells. So this is uh, veg 74 vegetation survey units with native grasses detected uh, during during the surveys from from 2011 to 2013. That's at, at Tomcat Ranch, um, and. So you know this is a, a really quite an interesting example of using grazing 
um, for native grass uh, dispersal. Uh, we talked before uh, about uh, when we were talking about the managing stocks of soil, water, and nutrients, um, about the low intensity permanent grazing to maintain forb diversity on serpentine grasslands in the Santa Clara Valley. Um, and this is an example um, where the, the opposite of the previous example, where we've got like one head of cattle per four hectares. Um, and uh, that's part of the management plan for bay checker spot butterflies and the serpentine bunch grass ecosystem um, to uh, e effectively remove um, some of the European annual grasses and, and, and create space uh, for not just the bunch grasses, but specifically the endemic um, serpentine plant species um, and the host plants for the bay checker spot butterfly. Another example would be sowing uh, native seeds and allowing grazers uh, to remove non-native biomass while dimpling the seed into the soil surface. And so, um, you know, this management technique would be as the f in the fall season as annual grasses emerge, um, um, sow the seed out um, after the first rains um, and, and, and the first European annual grasses have emerged. I do a very short duration, high intensity grazing um, and uh, the, the high intensity grazing will dimple the seed into the soil surface um, and remove a lot of those annual grasses. So it'll be very much akin to the grow and kill method. Um, and um, you know, can even be repeated in subsequent years with a more light intensity of grazing to dimple additional seed. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a technique that, you know, while it doesn't get um, enormous percent cover, um, can get, you know, 10 percent, 15, 20 percent cover. And, and it's a very useful technique in, in areas where you cannot get uh, machinery and to do drill seeding, um, where you can't, uh, um, uh, so for example, rocky slopes, oak woodlands, vernal pools, uh, this sort of thing. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, kind of following on from some of the other examples uh, that we talked about, feeding horses tree seeds to restore tropical dry forest on abandoned pastures um, in Guanacaste National Park in Costa Rica or, or native hay feed for cattle in, in Australia. So, um, uh, so, uh, in conclusion, plug planting and drill seeding, they, they yield more predictable results. Um, and so when you do active planting, container plants, plug plants, uh, uh, drill seeding, cuttings, you're, you're going to get more predictable results. Um, however, other methods such as recruitment and grazing and fire ma management can be effective when native species are present. Um, and specifically using grazers as, as seed dispersers can also be useful in accessible areas and sensitive habitat and for large-scale restoration projects. While you're going to get more predictable results from your active planting um, on larger projects where budgets do become a concern, then, then these alternate techniques uh, can be very valuable.